It is LSU Sunday, the one day when I get to come up and preach, I get to sit on the big boy side, and I get to wear a stole. I am a licensed local pastor, so this is not something I get to do. So to get to wear uh, a stole, especially such a, such a fancy stole, is a really special moment for me. There's always brass. Today we have not just Bob Courtney, but we also have Steve Backstrom rocking those subwoofer notes. It's a wonderful day. So it makes what I'm about to do a little bit anticlimactic. Uh, our sermon series has been called Express Yourself. And uh, so I decided I was going to express myself in a way that, uh, that I have often felt, but I've never done in a sermon before. Are you ready? <laughs> that seems like a weird thing to do while preaching a sermon. Uh, to be honest, it seems like a weird thing to do anyway, but who of us has ever felt that way? I see some hands down that should be up. Uh, I'm not quite sure why we do the whole uh, running your head into a wall thing. I wonder if it is part of the reaction that makes us put our face in our hands. Uh, but sometimes you want to go into a wall. I'm not sure if it's because of laziness, like putting up our hands would be too much energy. Uh, or I'm not sure if emotionally we feel like we have walls in our own life and there's something cathartic, maybe even relaxing about putting your head against something that physically does not move to match what you feel. Whether we do it out of frustration or embarrassment or whatever, there's one commonality and that's that it usually happens when things aren't going well. So why am I, a campus minister, on LSU Sunday, bringing this up. Well, for one, it's, uh, it's where we are in our sermon series, and for two, if you've ever been a student, which at University Methodist, many of you have, you know what 2 a.m. with a paper due the next morning is like. You're looking at a book, trying to bring some cogent thought to bring things together, to go onto a page, and your grade depends on it. It's like banging your head against a wall. In music school, we would quip at each other after spending days in the practice room. The, uh, the quote that's attributed to Einstein, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. And then we'd wander back into the practice room for another hour. But that's where the breakthroughs come. If you bang your head against the wall long enough, you start to make a crack start to get somewhere it's hard I remember my voice teacher was telling me a story about a student he'd had who had no vibrato uh, no dynamics to his singing voice at all uh, and just no matter what Dr. Maddox would do he just stayed uh, it's a Romeo there's just not much going on and then during one of those late nights when everybody is in the practice rooms, Dr. Maddox decides he's going to take a lap around the school and he hears... <laughs> Dr. Maddox throws open the practice room door, startling the student half to death, and says, That is it! What have you been doing? That is it! And the shocked student said, I was just doing a funny impression of an opera singer. <laughs> he banged his head against the wall long enough that he tried something just silly to him and made the breakthrough that he hadn't been able to make in years of lessons. So in our scripture today, Paul is discouraged. In the previous chapter, he's visited three different cities, though not for long. He preaches in the synagogue in each, and he gets invited to speak with philosophers. And this is Greece, the home of philosophy. Philosophy is a big deal. He gets to speak to philosophers in Athens. And even though he has some setbacks, he sees Jewish people believing his message. Uh, he sees Jewish people also believing that Jesus is the Messiah that we've waited for. He sees Gentiles finding Jesus as the missing piece the place where their restless hearts can find their rest. 
And then Paul comes to Corinth. If you've ever been to Corinth, it's a cool city. Uh, it is the home of the Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it is gigantic. Even though it collapsed, it has been partially reconstructed, and you can see how giant it is, taller than this building in the ancient world. Silver is big in the city, and there's a whole uh, economy of people making little silver figurines. And as we know from uh, the verse that is used in almost every wedding, 1 Corinthians 13, it also becomes the home of a thriving church. But this episode doesn't find us in a period of thriving. Maybe a better word would be thrashing. Paul has come with a husband and wife team, Prissa and Aquila, kind of rock stars of the early church, two Jewish Christians who've been kicked out of Rome, and they're all settling in Corinth together. They're tent makers. They sell their wares by the day, and on the Sabbath, and in their off times, they go to the synagogue and speak with Jewish people, and then they speak with Gentiles as well, sharing the story of Jesus. But unlike these other three places where Paul had just been in the previous chapter, it is arduous. He's getting nowhere. Are you familiar with the story of Sisyphus? The guy in, uh, in, uh, in Greek tradition that is cursed for all of eternity to push a large rock up a hill only to see it roll back again and have to start all over again. That's what this is like. No one's budging. And Paul is beginning to think, why am I even here? He even gets a little bit of a respite when some of his favorite co-workers and friends Silas and young, fresh-faced Timothy arrive. But even their interjection of energy doesn't seem to do anything for the situation. And eventually Paul screams, Enough! Your blood will be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now, I will go to the Gentiles. And we're told that he goes to the home of Titius Justus, the guy next door, uh, who we're told is a worshiper of God. And I, so I wonder if what Paul is really saying is, fine, if you don't want me, I'll go where people actually like me. It's funny how we do that with people we love. Surely we've never treated our spouses like that. Or our friends or kids. My friend Lauren told me a story about her mom that she never forgot. When Lauren was a little kid, uh, she was going shopping with her siblings and her mom in a grocery store. And her little brother starts throwing a tantrum about something. I think it's about a piece of candy he wanted. And his mom won't get it for him. So he elevates the tantrum until it leads to him laying flat on, on his back on the floor, thrashing and screaming, my mom is so bad, my mom is so bad. Meanwhile, this mom is just trying to mind Lauren and her siblings this pastel of kids. She's got groceries to buy. She's got a schedule to keep. And when this kid is not getting up, she's finally banged her head against the wall, uh, trying to reason with this unreasonable human being, and she has had it. So she decided she was going to speak to her child in the only language she seemed to understand at the moment. So she throws herself on her back and starts kicking and thrashing and screaming and saying, my mom is so bad. My mom is so bad. Meanwhile, Lauren's little brother stops thrashing. He stops whining. He's still on the floor, but his display of protest has given way to stunned silence and then horror. <laughs> as his mom shows him exactly what that behavior looks like. Lauren never forgot that. And her brother certainly didn't forget that. And they learned, don't ever throw yourself indecently on your feet over something like candy, or mom will show you exactly what that looks like. It seems like an egregious display, but Lauren's mom had banged her head against the wall long enough that eventually cracks began to form, and she made a breakthrough. A little crack, then a little chink in the wall, and then a brick, and the light begins to get in. If the, roll, if the rock rolls down the hill every time, you can either give up and wander, or you can think maybe things will be a little bit different this next time. As parents, as Christians, as artists, we bang our heads against a wall and cracks do form. 
And as the great Leonard Cohen once said in his characteristically raspy voice, the wars will be fought again, the holy dove will be caught again, but there's a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. That's how the light gets in. So Paul, finally, he's just had it. He goes next door. But then the next sentence we get is that Crispus, one of the leaders of the synagogue, decides that he and his entire family will believe in what Paul is preaching. And their entire family is baptized. And then many who have heard Paul begin to flow as the ripples go outward. And this dynamic church is formed when Paul was at the end of his rope. The story ends with, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. No one's going to attack you or harm you, for I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. And our New Testament has two books dedicated to that city as this thriving church develops. Our theme today is express yourself, bold action. And when we like to think, or at least when I like to think of bold action, I like to think of Henry V. Once more into the breach, my dear friends, once more. And we get great moments like that when our character is tested. But to anyone who's ever studied or played music or parented, we know sometimes the boldest action is to continue hammering away, trusting that cracks will form eventually and breakthroughs will be made. I'm always touched of the story of Francis Collins, the scientist, who in slamming his head against the human genome over and over and over, considering himself an atheist, he began to see in the DNA strands God's language and found himself a believer through banging himself, uh, his head against the wall for so long. And I also recall the story of Winston Churchill when he was asked to give a speech to a whole class of people. And they expected, the people putting on the speech, expected him to have something wonderful and long and eloquent to say. But he walks up and he pounds his hands on the, on the podium and yells, never give up. And he walks off the stage. The organizer gets up and says, ah, I think you had... I think you had some more things you wanted to share with our students, surely. So he comes back up, and even louder now, he says, never give up, and walks off the stage. If you don't like banging your head against a wall, then you're, you're missing part of the point of faith. Because God is active in our everyday life, and it takes prayer, and it takes energy and consistency to see where God is active. Making breakthroughs in our study, parenting our children and our work takes banging our head against the wall. And making a difference in this community is not always rewarding. Sometimes it is that long serving work of banging your head against the wall that helps these students, professors and others understand that university is a place where love, uh, love reigns and that they would be welcome. Anything less is giving up. 